This is a lesson on mass energy equivalence and the last of the lessons on module 7, the nature of what, the HSC physics course. So previously we've seen that not only time and space become distorted and are relative quantities, okay, becoming more pronounced as you approach the speed of light, but also the mass of an object uh, increases as you approach the speed of light. Let's now look at the implication for an object at the speed of light uh, in terms of its mass, so moving at the speed of light, oh, sorry, approaching the speed of light in terms of its mass. Suppose you have an object, some hunk of material, and it's moving along a constant force. Now this force does work, so it does work on the object. Okay, and this increases the kinetic energy of the object in turn. Suppose now that the object almost approaches the speed of light, okay, this is very close to the speed of light, the energy that you put into the object, energy in, will be equal to the work done on the object in one second, let's say. So if it now travels at the speed of light, it'll travel a distance given by this d equals vt, which is equal to ct, replacing v with c because c is the speed of light. That's equal to c, okay, where t is one second, replacing t by one second. So each second it travels at the speed of light, and the energy transferred to the object will be given by this. So energy transferred per second in this case is equal to the work done in one second, right? In other words, E is equal to the amount of work done in one second. So work is given by force times displacement. That's equal to FC. Okay, as we've seen before here. Okay, the D could be replaced with S. In other words, right, displacement along one direction. And E is equal to FC. And we also know the change in momentum of the object is its final mass times its uh, final velocity minus its initial mass times its initial velocity. And that's equal to Ft, okay, from Newton's uh, second law. Okay, and change in momentum is basically equal to force times time. Now, as the velocity stays constant, so since C, so since V is equal to U, which is equal to C, in other words, because the object is traveling at the speed of light, and the change in momentum per second, okay, when time is, is equal to one second, we'll get delta P is equal to M sub FC minus M sub IC. That's equal to delta M, right? Because MF, M sub F minus M sub I is delta M times C, the speed of light, and that's equal to the force. Right? Taking T to be one. Now, when the object approaches the speed of light, the object can no longer go faster. Okay, and the only way the kinetic energy can increase is by increasing the mass of the object. Okay, so increasing the mass increases the kinetic energy. And so therefore energy is transferred to the object okay, through its mass. Okay, in other words, the amount of energy converted to mass, so F is equal to delta mc, right from here, F is equal to delta mc. Let's plug this into the uh, expression for the um, for energy above, which is just E equals fc from above. So E is equal to putting delta mc instead of f, delta mc, multiply that by c, you can see where I'm going with this probably. That's just delta mc squared. This is Einstein's famous equation, okay, and can be simplified to E equals mc squared. So using the idea of energy, kinetic energy and momentum, we can derive Einstein's formula E equals mc squared. Now, in the HC, we won't be required to derive this. It's just nice to see where it comes from. And this is the, this is the famous mass-energy equivalence formula. Okay, 1905, proposed by Einstein. If you plug in for M, so E is for energy. Energy is measured in joules. M is mass, measured in kilograms. C is the speed of light, it's a number. It's three times 10 to the eight meters per second. So what this tells you, it's quite profound, that one kilogram of anything 
If you plug that in, one, one times three times 10 to the eight squared, that's equivalent to nine times 10 to the 26 joules of energy, which is a massive amount of energy from a relatively small amount of mass. That's how much energy you get when you unlock all the, the bonds between the particles making up the one kilogram mass. Could be anything, could be uranium, it could be uh, even plastic for that matter. And once again, there was no available physical experimental evidence at the time in 1905 to prove this relationship. And uh, Einstein actually proposed that radioactivity might be an example of mass energy conversion. Uh, this was actually later, sadly, fortunately verified in 1945 when the atomic bomb was dropped over Nagasaki and Hiroshima in Japan, uh, finishing off the Second World War. Uh, but since then, there's been a large number of experimental evidence that's been accumulated to verify Einstein's uh, mass energy equivalence of E equals MC squared. And today we accept that all chemical and nuclear reactions, they all involve the release or absorption of energy. And they basically require mass being converted into energy. Okay, or vice versa, respectively. Uh, so, for example, in stars, mass gets converted into energy okay, through a process called nuclear fusion. And this is covered in Module 8 from the Universe to the Atom. Through nuclear fusion, by fusing, basically by fusing small nuclei, typically um, hydrogen nuclei, so just protons, to form larger nuclei. Okay, in their cores. So at the very core of a star, at the very center, nuclear fusion occurs, and this involves converting mass from the particles into energy, okay, which is which is why the sun shines. The sun shines because of all, all that energy from the sun is coming from nuclear fusion, mass being converted into energy. Another example is nuclear power, power plants, nuclear reactors. Okay, they involve fission, which is the splitting, splitting, of larger nuclei, so heavy, massive nuclei into uh, smaller nuclei. So fission involving uh, converting mass into energy once again. And there's also the example, as per the HC syllabus dot point, the combustion of chemical fuels, combustion of fuel. Okay, this involves mass into energy by rearranging, in this case, rearranging chemical bonds. Okay, chemical reactions, uh, as opposed to nuclear reactions, involve rearrangement of chemical bonds. Let's now do an example involving numbers. Suppose the sun... the sun has intensity of 13, 1, 3, 6, 1, 1361 watts per meter squared. So that's the intensity of the sun's radiation. And the energy radiated per second by the sun is given by this number, 3.85 times 10 to the 26 watts, which is massive. And we need to work out the amount of mass being converted into energy by the sun per second. So to work this out, we need to use Einstein's E equals mc squared to work out how much mass gets converted into energy. And the way to do this is by rearranging for m, E over c squared. E is given by energy radiated per second, which is this, 3.85 times 10 to the 26, divided by c squared, which is the speed of light squared, 3 times 10 to the 8 squared. Doing that gives you 4.28 times 10 to the 9 kilograms per second, right? Because mass is measured in kilograms per second per second. So a very simple example. Let's do another one. Suppose you have what's called a positron, okay? This is the antimatter equivalent of an electron. There are particles called antiparticles in the universe. There's, there's double the amount of particles in the universe. You've got particles and antiparticles. Antiparticles are the exact same as their counterparts, the particles, but with opposite charge. 
Okay, they've got the same mass but opposite charge. So you suppose you have a positron, this is called a positive electron, positron, and it's got a mass of 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31 kilos, so the same mass as an electron. Suppose a positron and an electron meet. Now with uh, matter and antimatter, if a matter particle and an antimatter particle meet, they annihilate and they destroy and create uh, energy, pure energy, in this case light, okay, gamma rays. They produce high energy gamma rays, high energy light. And you'll see there's two rays because whatever comes in has to come out. According to the law of conservation of energy, you've got two particles coming in, and so therefore two particles are coming out. Okay, these are called pho um, these are photons, photons of light. Suppose we need to work out the energy from the annihilation. So annihilation means to destroy completely. And let's suppose we need to work out the wavelength of the emitted gamma rays. Okay, it's a very simple process. To work out the energy from annihilation, I equals mc squared. Now the mass of the positron, we need to also take into account the mass of the electron. So we need to do two times the mass, which is 9.109 times 10 to the minus 31, because it's two particles, times the speed of light squared, three times that 10 to the 8 squared, and that gives you 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules. B, we need to work out the wavelength of the emitted gamma rays. Now, we know that for one gamma ray photon, one particle of light, energy is given by 1.64 times 10 to the minus 13 joules divided by 2. Okay, because this is the combined energy here of the gamma rays. And that gives you 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules okay, for one gamma ray photon. Now we know what the energy is. To work out wavelength, we know the expression E equals HF, the Planck-Einstein expression. We can sub in HC over lambda, okay? C over lambda for F. So if you recall, C equals F lambda, so therefore F equals C over lambda. And that gives us uh, Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 times the speed of light, 3 times 10 to the 8, divided by the wavelength, oh, sorry, the energy, so rearranging for lambda gives you hc over e, and dividing by the energy, which is 8.2 times 10 to the minus 14 joules, and so the wavelength of one gamma ray photon is 2.42 times 10 to the minus 12 meters. Okay, so that's an example involving the annihilation of two particles. We'll do another one involving chemical combustion. So suppose a chemical combustion reaction of petroleum releases 46 megajoules per kilogram. And we need to work out the percentage of the initial mass of petrol that gets converted into energy. So the mass that's lost, in other words, let's work this out, this requires us to use E equals mc squared. m is equal to E over c squared. Energy is 4.6, so, sorry, 46 times 10 to the 6, okay, that's 4, 46 megajoules. Let's have it in joules, divided by the speed of light squared. That's 3.1 times 10 to the minus 10 kilograms worth of mass that's lost. Now, the percentage of mass lost is 5.1 times 10 to the minus 10, apologies, that's say 5, divided by 1 times 100. Okay, initially you've got, let's say, 1, 1 kilo, because it's, it's 46 megajoules per kilo, right? So dividing that by 1 kilo times 100, and you get 5.1 times 10 to the minus 8 percent. Okay, so that's the percentage of the initial mass of petrol that's converted into energy. Not very much if you think about it, okay? That gives you a lot of, a lot of energy. And so that concludes uh, this module. So not that long of a module, but it's, it covers a lot in terms of um, theories and models of light. So we've looked at how what, uh, light, you know, is it a particle, is it a wave? Um, what does it do when it bounces off things or when it passes through a slit? What happens as you uh, shoot it through a glass prism? What can it tell you about things like stars and what happens as you approach the speed of light in terms of things like space, time, uh, energy, momentum, 
and all that. So very fascinating module.